boof, sniff, sniff heck, bow wow, bork, bork, sniff sniff, yip. Oh, uh, uh, hey, so what's with all the new dog Pokemon in Scarlet and Violet? Back in Generation 1, we had the Arcanine and Ninetales lines, but foxes are pretty unique in the canine world, so nobody bats an eye. In Gen 2, we got the Hound, Doom, and Granbull lines. That's plenty of dogs, but they also added Smeargle, a beagle, but at least it's not obviously a dog at first glance. I mean, many people are still surprised to hear that it's a beagle sometimes. Uh, Gen 3, we got the Manetric and Mightyena lines, Sort of. Mightyena evolves from Poochyena, which is obviously a pooch, and the lion is like a wolf crossed with a hyena. But the thing is, hyenas are not dogs. In fact, they are more closely related to cats than they are to dogs. Uh, but uh, Gen 4. At least in Gen 4, there's no just straight up, it's just a dog Pokemon. But there is Lucario, which is a jackal furry. Yeah. But then in Gen 5, they make up for the lack of Gen 4's It's Just a Dog Pokemon by giving us the Stoutland run, which is like the most It's Just a Dog Pokemon to date. And there's another fox with Zorark, though it's pretty unique. Gen 6, another fox, a starter even this time. And we also get Furfuru, which is another basic dog type dog. But at least it's got a fancy gimmick, yeah? It gets a cute little hat with a cute little haircut because it's a poodle. And then there's also Swirlix and Slurpuff, but they too are barely dogs, pulling much more of their design from their other elements. Gen 7, we get Rockruff and Lycanroc, three forms of it even. Well, two and a half. And even more foxes with Gen 8, plus two Zippy Zappy basic dogs, even though we already have Zippy Zappy dogs. Hmm. At least the amper is cute, but then inside this game there are two wolves. One of them is a box legendary, and the other one is also a box legendary. And now, looking at all of the canine Pokémon, you realize, yeah, there's a lot of them. A surprising amount of foxes, even. But at least, they are pretty well spread out throughout the decks. But then, most recently, in Gen 9, we got six basic bi- uh, oh, can I say that? The, the context, I'm talking about literal dogs. It's the proper terminology. No? Uh, okay, I won't say it. Well, six more basic dogs. Like, they don't even change much when they evolve. Two of them just get older, and the third one just gets baked. <laughs> uh, well, let's go ahead and cover them all anyway. What are these six dogs based on? A bread dog? A dead dog? A shred dog? And why are they all in Paldea? Well, let's get into it. So hey, how old you doing? Do you have a dog? Do you let your dog on your bed? What does your dog do once he's on your bed? Well, he knows you've had a rough day, so he licks you. This video is sponsored by Helix Sleep. I got a Helix mattress five years ago, and after taking their easy online sleep quiz, which matches you and a partner to the perfect mattress, it was delivered to our doorstep, and we set it up with ease. And gosh, my back has never been the same. Um... Oh, thanks, dog. <coughs> Hopefully I won't need to see a dog tour about that. <laughs> S stay But really, though, my Midnight Lux from Helix is so much more comfortable than my old generic mattress. And it's got a cooling cover, so even if you get dog-piled by your hot partner and like a million dogs, it'll still help you keep cool. And you don't need to worry about needing to dig up old bones to afford it, as they've got canine dancing options. <coughs> Which is a bad pun way of saying they've got financing options. Helix offers a 100 night sleep trial to make sure you love it. And if you don't, for any reason, they will not only give you a full refund, but they will even come and fetch the mattress back for you, totally worry free. And you'll be even more unflustered by their 10 year warranty. That's like 70 dog years. Oh, positively delightful. And to top it all off, I've made it easy for you. With this link, you can click in the description, helixsleep.com slash Loxton. You'll get $200 off of your Helix mattress plus two free pillows. Maybe give one to your heckin' good pupperino. 13 out of 10. Look at that. So cute. Yeah, he likes it. You look so posh, leaving that pug life behind. Now then, let's analyze you. We've got to go over every detail. Look at this face. Does this look like the face of a kind-hearted dog to you? It looks constipated. 
Mastiff is clearly a puppy, but what's the breed? Well, easy, a Mastiff, both in name and in looks. It has a coat pattern similar to a lot of Mastiff breeds, mostly the Bull Mastiff and the English Mastiff, with a muzzle that's a lot darker than the rest of its body. And of course, it has the droopy jowls that Mastiffs are known for. Mastiffs are also known for a duality of juxtaposing personality types, which is reflected in this Pokemon's dex entries. Its well-developed jaw and fangs are strong enough to crunch through boulders, and its thick fat makes for an excellent defense. Rawr, it's fierce! It always scowls in an attempt to make opponents take it seriously. But even crying children will burst into laughter when they see Mastiff's face. He's a silly dog. But hey, Aldea is based on the Iberian Peninsula, which is where Spain and Portugal are, and Spain has some of their own Mastiff breeds. Surprise, surprise, they named it the Spanish Mastiff. But another breed from the region is the Pyrenean, Pyrenean Mastiff which comes from the Spanish side of the Pyrenees Mountains, and has long and fluffy fur just like Mastiff's evolution, Mabostiff, which we'll get to. For now, look at Mastiff's blonde hair running down its back. Blonde hair like that typically screams youth, right? It's young and inexperienced, and it's up to mischief. Hence the name. And it fits alongside the media trope of young little blonde boys being troublemakers. The first examples that come to mind are like Dennis the Menace and Kevin in Home Alone. You know, that whole media trope. And litters or small packs of Mastiff tend to gang up on other Pokemon in the wild, like a gang of young school bullies. And this makes their dark typing start to make sense. The dark type isn't about literal darkness, it's about dark, mean, dirty, grim tactics, and Mastiff guard dogs that tend to not be properly trained tend to be especially mean, ruthless, and damaging. And Mastiff ganging up like this makes them out to be like young, inexperienced Mafia or Yakuza members. In fact, young upstart Yakuza members dyeing their hair blonde or other lighter colors is another big media trope, and they always feel a need to try and prove their worth to the older members by intimidating civilians or members of other Yakuza clans, but they often just come across as silly looking, and they even do that head thing that Mastiff does. Eh? You trying to say something? Look at me, I'm tough with my stupid haircut. It's very fitting. And then it evolves into Mabostiff, who clearly looks wiser and older, much older, so old that its joints have gone stiff, which is why it has stiff in the name. It's also the boss, the chief, the head honcho. Its blonde hair has turned gray, as have its eyebrows and body to varying degrees. It now has even more fluffy fur than it did in its youth, because now it gets cold so easily without it. And it now more closely resembles the Pyrenean Mastiff more so than its previous form. Mabostiff loves playing with children. Though usually gentle, it takes on an intimidating look when protecting its family. It's like how mob bosses, or godfathers, fiercely protect their gang members and family. While many put on a tough exterior, they are often shown to have a soft side for children, like in the Yakuza game series by Sega, with Kiryu's adoptive dad and the children in the orphanage that he started. It's fitting too, because both Mastiff breeds were initially bred to protect flocks of sheep and goats, or as guard dogs to protect their owners, especially the owner's children. And what's cool is that both Mon and the line can be found in some of the same areas in the wild where the sheep Pokemon, like Mareep, spawn. They're not aligned perfectly of course, but there's a lot of overlap. Mabostiff's dewlap also resembles the extra flappy skin that a lot of Mastiffs get, while still clearly being extra fur in Mabostiff's specific case. It stores energy in that dewlap, and it unleashes this energy all at once to blow away enemies. It's like the trope of a frail, old mafia or Yakuza boss, and a lot of the civilians and other gang members are always wondering, well, why is he still the leader? Why hasn't anyone ousted him yet? He's so old and frail and out of touch, weak. But then towards the end, when an enemy somehow manages to get past all his guards, the old boss goes full martial artist on their sorry behind. Though afterwards, that burst of energy often leaves them as tired looking and frail as they were before. Or in the case of your traditional Italian mafia, they are just ruthless and will pull out a big gun. Now, we know for sure that there are Italian mafia references in here, both because, I mean, look at it, but also because of its Japanese name, Mafi Fitu, which combines mafia and mastiff. And while Italy is not Iberia, it is another peninsula along the Mediterranean, so they share a lot of similarities. I mean, olives. But also, looking at the history of mafias in Spain, 
Spanish mafias were not homegrown. They were the Italian and other foreign mafia families setting up shop in Spain. Barcelona was a huge hub for the Italian Mafia for a time because Spain's connections to Latin America made importing illegal drugs to sell throughout Europe a breeze. Hence why an Italian Mafia dog is in Paldea. And I love that. But I don't love this spooky transition. Oh! Greybird is a cute but spooky little ghost dog. It grieves for the loss of itself and those around it. But the grieve in the name also reflects the candle atop its head. You see, in the Middle Ages, candles made of wax were a luxury item. Most peasants would have to make their candles out of discarded tallow, animal fat, and this process of candle making left behind a byproduct called greaves. And like back then, today, greaves are mostly used in animal feed, particularly dog food. So a grieving candle dog? Oh boy, it's just, a, it's such a good, like, triple meaning. Plus, that candle is vaguely shaped like a cartoony dog bone, is it not? And also, the name Grieverd also pulls from one of the dog breeds it's mostly pulling from, another sheepdog, the Briard, or Burger de Brie. Yes, like the cheese. This dog is a cheeseburger. <laughs> it's a French breed that's also quite popular in the neighboring Spain, so popular in fact that they eventually bred their own, the Catalan Sheepdog. And it was bred for the same purpose, and looks almost exactly like it, but its name doesn't exactly sound anything like Grieverd, so... Mm. Aside from herding sheep, Briards are known for having fur that looks and feels more like a goat's fur than a dog's, and Briards are also known for absolutely loving kids just like Grieverd. That's common with a lot of sheepdog breeds, actually, and tangentially related, they tend to not realize just how big that they are, and can sometimes accidentally hurt children or small animals they interact with if not properly trained. Like how Grieverd accidentally slowly drains the life force of those it plays with via the flame atop its head. It's clearly a reference to the idea of holding candlelight vigils for the dead, and or leaving candles or lamps on a grave for the first few nights while you grieve for them. Portugal and parts of Spain near Portugal have a relevant folk tale here as well. The Santa Campania, which is a procession of the undead walking among the living. A procession of souls in anguish, led by a local parishioner under a curse. The Santa Campania wear long, white hooded robes, not unlike Grieverd's long white fur, and they can be identified by a heavy fog and the smell of candle wax in the air, as the procession are always carrying many candles. They will not purposefully do you any harm, but if you happen to get too close, or even acknowledge their presence, they will slowly drain you of your life force. Sounds familiar, eh? And perhaps poor Grieverd is unwittingly doing the same. In the wild, they are always found in large groups as well, their main bodies buried underground like a buried corpse. Or a dog that really happens to like digging. For bones! Grieverd evolves into Houndstone, an undead Skeladoggo. Now it has scraggly, dirty fur, especially the shiny, and the candle has now become a gravestone, otherwise called a headstone, on its head. Hence the name, Houndstone. It's a headstone, but it's a hound, ah! It is canonically the most loyal dog Pokémon, a reference to a rather sad phenomenon. Dogs being so loyal to their owner that they sit by their owner's gravesite long after they are dead. Or, in Fry's dog Seymour Ass's case, waiting every day at the spot they were supposed to meet. Every day until the dog itself dies. The most well-known real-world example of this is Greyfriars Bobby, who became known in 19th century Edinburgh for spending 14 years straight guarding the grave of his owner until he himself died in 1872. Then he himself was buried not far from his dearly departed owner's grave, and was most likely the main pupper that Futurama was referencing when they created Seymour. And both Seymour and Houndstone are shaggy and scruffy, just like Greyfriars Bobby was. So basically, Houndstone is an extremely loyal dog whose owner died, and it spent so long mourning at its owner's grave that it became mangy and dirty, and then somehow became one with the grave. And its love for its owner is what kept it alive, or unalive as the case may be. 
and now it's skeletal, from starving to undeath. And when shiny, their fur becomes this yucky tan color, a reference to rotting hair or to tall dead grass around the base of a tombstone. Now, it is for sure worth mentioning a sort of connection here. Both the Houndstone and Mabostiff lines could be referencing Cadejo, a Latin American shaggy ghost dog that is either all white if it is good, like a kind and loyal dog, like Grieverd, or all black if it is bad, like a mean-spirited dark-type dog like Mabostiff. The Cadejo appear at night to travelers, and the white protects them like a sheepdog, and the black wishes to kill them. They are said to have a goat-like smell, and sometimes even goat-like hooves. And remember what we said about the Briard having goat-like fur? Well, the Briard is also very similar to Mabostiff in colors and overall shape, and Mastiff and Mabostiff's shiny colors make them significantly blacker even, like the evil Cadejo. So perhaps that was considered here, but also perhaps not. Back to the ghost dogs though, it is for sure worth mentioning the Great Pyrenees, another dog breed they have similarities to. They are big, white, and fluffy, and come from the French side of the Pyrenees Mountains, which borders between Spain and France. They too were bred as sheepdogs, specifically for sheep in the cold mountains, which is why they are so especially fluffy and white, both to camouflage it in the snow from its predators, and so that the sheep trust it more. Sheep have an easier time trusting Whitey, but the bond of trust between sheepdog and the herd is super important, so a lot of shepherds, even to this day, will usually get the dog as a puppy, and immediately have it live outside with the herd basically all the time. That way, the bond between the dog and the herd is strong long before it's big enough to even actually do any protecting. And of course, it makes them loyal to all of the sheep, like the ever loyal Houndstone. Oh, jeez. It's actually getting really hot in here. What's going on? Oh, gosh, I'm baking! This is Fido! Fido, spelled with just the first four letters, is one of the most stereotypical dog names. Super common. But here, it's literally Doe. It's an unbaked bread dog, heavily inspired by Cocker Spaniels, which were originally bred to flush out woodcocks. Haha, <laughs> yes, wieners, T-E, hence the name Cocker. And they supposedly do originate in Spain, though the first real reference to them occurred in England all the way back in the 14th century, which could be reflected in this Pokedex entry. The yeast in Fido's breath is useful for cooking. So, this Pokemon has been protected by people since long ago. Long ago? Like the 14th century, perhaps? Also, yeast in Fido's breath induces fermentation in the Pokemon's vicinity. So, it's definitely inspired mostly by risen, but not yet baked, dough. Probably uncooked rasquillas, which are traditional Spanish deep-fried donuts, characterized by their fluffy texture and a hole in the middle. Or perhaps it's an ensaimada, which is a 17th century Spanish pastry that evolved from Middle Eastern pastries, as the name even pulls from Arabic sahim, meaning fat. And yeah, this sure is a fat dog. Its Japanese name is Puppy Mochi, which may be a combination of puppy and mochi mochi, meaning doughy and springy, or even mochi, the Japanese rice cake known for being doughy and springy. Fido evolves into Dash Bun. Doxbun. Fido then evolves into Doxbun. It is now a darker brownish red color, implying that the dough is now baked. In fact, it now has a signature ability called Well Baked Body, which renders fire type attacks useless against it. In fact, its defense will even rise if it's hit by one, like a bread crust getting harder and harder as you overbake it. Also, Doxbun is an amazing bread dessert pun. A bunt pan is a cake pan that heavily resembles a big and sometimes rigid or wavy donut. Like Doc's Bun's ears! with an added little donut hole bit in the center, and its tail is like a donut with cream-like fur coming out of the middle. And as Fido is mostly a Cocker Spaniel, Doc's Bun is most obviously based on a... yeah... a Dachshund. Or Dash Hund, Dash Hound, Dox Hound? I've always heard it pronounced Dachshund, is that right? Um, but otherwise, it's known as the Wiener Dog in the US. Or if you're from across the pond, then you call it a sausage dog? Why would you call it a sausage? Anyways, they are a breed with German origins. They were originally bred for hunting badgers, hence the Dox, which means badger in German. And they would later be used in a lot of rabbit and fox hunting too. And if you had a whole pack of them, you could get them to hunt game as large as wild boar and as fierce as the wolverine. I can't even imagine a picture of tiny little wiener dogs doing that, but 
Okay. Apparently the wiener dogs I've always interacted with have been the mini weenies. So I guess if they were a lot bigger, that would make sense. But fun fact, while their breed name is technically Dachshund, a German word, the Germans themselves more so call them Dackel or Tekel, which is also why the German name of this Pokemon is Backel. It means baked dog. Also, related fun fact, those bobble-headed dogs that were most commonly depicting wiener dogs and were on several dashboards in the early 2000s, they too come from Germany and are known as Wackeldackel, meaning wobbly wiener dog, essentially. And they were so popular 20 years ago, in Germany especially, so much to the point where there's a term for a yes man that's essentially Wackeldackel. Just nodding your head to whatever you say nonstop. Like one of these dogs. <clears throat> Long-winded tangent over. Dash hounds or dachshunds have long, skinny bodies, like this little dude, and can come in basically any dog pattern you can imagine. But the two most common coat patterns are red and the black and tan, and dachshund is like a mixture of the two. And they also come in three main varieties of coat type, short, long, and wiry. And dachshund definitely seems to be mostly inspired by the long coat, especially considering its fluffy chest and tail. Wiener dogs have especially long ears, which is to keep seeds and dirt out of their ear canal. And dachshund's ears, while not as long, are definitely big, and look like they'd be really good at keeping the wheat seeds it is kept near out of its ear canals. Dachshund's pleasant aroma that emanates from this Pokemon's body Body helps wheat grow, so Doxbun has been treasured by farming villages. Which explains why it needs those big ears that keep seeds out of the ear canal. I really like its Japanese name, Boutsel. It's most likely a combination of Bow Wow, the sound dogs make, and Fretzel, which makes sense given the twisted and braided aspect of both its ears and its back. It's like a giant soft pretzel. But it's also like a brioche bun, which its French name, Briochen, derives from. Plus, in game, its coat is very shiny and reflective, like both soft pretzels and brioche buns. Oh, I love the little slits it has in its paws. It denotes its toes, yes, but if you notice, it doesn't actually have toes. Rather, these are just like the slits that you put into various breads so that when it bakes, the excess air inside has somewhere to go and doesn't just create a huge air bubble inside of the bread. These slits can be as simple as just one or two little cuts but they can also be done in such a fancy, elegant way that it turns them into beautiful works of art. I just love all of the bready details here. And I just love bread. It's so sad that it's a sin. So, now with all six dogs covered, we gotta answer the question, why are there six whole new, relatively basic dog Pokemon here? And plus, a lot of the other dog Pokemon from previous generations are found here in Paldea too. Why? 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 Well, it's because, turns out, Spain's dog culture is relatively intense. In fact, there's an extremely popular website called Señor Perro, and it is all about how to travel Spain with your dog. You'll find many restaurants and businesses that even have official Señor Perro stickers in their windows that let you know that it is a dog-friendly establishment. And even then, many of the bars or restaurants that don't allow dogs inside will leave water bowls outside for doggos that are just chillin'. Spain also has a lot of off-leash parks too, and many a well-known off-leash beach. In fact, across the globe, Spain was ranked the 8th most dog-friendly country in 2022. But honestly, that should just come as no surprise for the country with the most dogs per capita in Europe. For every 20 people in Spain, there's a dog, and that's just the registered ones. How many dogs are unregistered because they just are born and are feral, or are born and then just accepted, sold, unregisteredly, underhanded, market, black puppy mill, black market shenanigans. There's a lot of unregistered dogs. So of course, if there is ever a time to get this many new dog Pokemon that are just like dogs, it's now. It's so good. Which is your favorite? And do you know how good of a dog Relicanth is? Relicanth is a very good dog. And you can learn why by checking out this video next. And until next time, Never stop using your noggin. Woof woof bark, bark yiff, heck, sniff sniff, heck bow wow bark, heck, sniff sniff. What the dog doing? That's how you say never stop using your noggin in dog.